So uh, it's my pleasure now to uh, welcome Joel with New Gold to give us uh, an, an update on Blackwater, uh, which actually you know, defines an emerging gold-silver district in the Stikine Train of central British Columbia. Joel, welcome to the stage. Thanks a lot, Bruce. Uh, before we get going, at first I'd really like to thank Geoscience BC for inviting us uh, as New Gold to present and be with you here today at this workshop. Also thanks a lot to Joel and Craig and, and the crew for their continued efforts to help us understand what's going on in the Trek region. Um, I'd also like to extend a big thanks to MDRU, in particular Aaron Luby and Thomas Bissig and Craig Hart. Um, over the last few years they've really uh, gone to great lengths to help us understand what the heck is going on up at Blackwater. So as Bruce mentioned, I'm the other Joel. I work with New Gold. Uh, I've been a, a geo for New Gold for quite some time. I worked up at Blackwater from about April 2012 until uh, August 2014. Um, I think Craig and Joel did a great job of setting us up for the regional setting, so I'm not going to talk a heck of a lot about that today. Uh, we'll get right into the deposit. We'll talk about the host rocks and a lot of Aaron Luby's work uh, that encompasses some paragenesis with the mineral assemblages there, uh, sulfur isotopes and some age dating work. Uh, and then we'll try to synthesize this and discuss a bit of a link between this inferred epithermal deposit and uh, local intrusives. Then we'll wrap it up with a few conclusions and a few questions. And before I proceed, I must show you the obligatory cautionary statements. And I thought it'd be a nice lead in to use uh, Joel's beautiful new map here as our location diagram. I think many of you are familiar with where Blackwater sits. We're about two and a half hours southwest of Vanderhoof via Forest Service Road, and we're on the, uh, the red star there in both the full trek panel on the left and then the inset to the right. Um, I'll be the first to admit I haven't had the time to digest fully your map, Joel. I'm really looking forward to the report. Um, but I am pretty excited to see that we've got a bit more Kasalka group rocks mapped up to the north and to the northeast of the Blackwater deposit. So I really look forward to talking to you about that. Um, next, we have a little bit of a cartoon. The regional stratigraphy is summarized there on the left. A lot of the familiar players uh, with the Jurassic Hazelton, Bowser Lake group, uh, Kasalka group there in the late Cretaceous, of course, unconformably overlain by Yasin Utsa, and then our arch nemesis, the, the Chilcotin that uh, Craig talked about. Over on the right, we have uh, a cartoony strat column of the Blackwater deposit rocks. Um, the oldest rocks we see within the immediate deposit area uh, are the Bowser Lake Ashman sediments. Those are dominantly mudstones. And those are unconformably overlain by uh, deposit. Uh, should be tracky andesites, it sounds like. Got that one right, All right, Joel? Uh, and then we move up through some more felsic uh, to intermediate volcanic rocks that consist of breaches and flow domes, uh, fragmental units, uh, and flow laminated uh, rhyolites. And then that's all unconformably overlain by uh, Eocene gate andesite. Aaron Luby and MDRU have helped us pin down mineralization. This has been out since I think 2013. Uh, age date, argon argon dates on green sericite from the main stage mineralization is dated now at 65 and a half MA, plus minus about a million years. And if we zoom into the, the area of work, uh, I should first note our blue outline there represents the claim boundary, and that's since been updated. Within the last few months, we've actually picked up the Parlane and RJK ground, which brings our uh, area total to almost 1,500 square kilometers. So, sounds like a big area, but if you know 99% of it's covered by glacial till, uh, maybe that helps out our efforts with boots on the ground. Um, the project sits within the Chaco uplift, and that's defined by the Nalkoos Fault, which you see up in the northwest corner of the map, and also by the Blackwater Fault down to the southeast corner of the map. And it's all uh, bisected by the Top Lake Fault that's parallel to the Natalcoos and Blackwater. Uh, the Top Lake Fault uh, separates two main blocks. We see dominantly older rocks that sit off to the west. Uh, so the Jurassic Hazelton group is painted there in green on the map. Uh, and then over to the east on the Blackwater side, we have a few more younger rocks. So uh, the Bowser, Ashman, and Naglico 
volcanics are shown there in the gray and blue color, and then late Cretaceous Casalca there in the orange with the Eocene in the yellow. We're also showing a few age dates. Uh, we've been able to pin down the emplacement of the host rhyolite sequence at Blackwater to about 71 to 76 MA. Uh, those are all uranium lead uh, age dates. And then we've got a post-mineral uh, sill that runs through the deposit that's been dated at 67 and a half. The uh, near, nearest intrusive to the Blackwater deposit that we'll talk a little bit about here later is the Blackwater Pluton. And that's been dated at 69 and a half plus minus two million years. I'm just showing this slide to give you a chance to have a look at what the host rocks look like in an unaltered state. This is kind of a rare occurrence in the drill core at Blackwater. The top shows you uh, intermediate to felsic fragmental volcanic rock and then some of the flow laminated uh, rhyolites that we have down below. Uh, next, I'm going to move into some of Erin's work. She's done a great job of helping uh, observe the different minerals uh, and their paragenesis at the Blackwater deposit and putting them into some assemblage groups. Uh, and I've lumped the first group of assemblages into the pre-gold stage, uh, the most distal being this actinolite sulfide assemblage. Uh, and then as we move a little bit closer in towards our tracheandesites, uh, we get some biotite, sericite, arsenopyrite alteration. And then as we move into the more intermediate felsic rocks, we start to see things like uh, garnet, uh, garnet sulfide and sericite. And so this photo that came up with this group highlights that last assemblage. You see the, the little circular dark splotches with the white rims. That represents uh, garnet and sulfide aggregates replacing mafic sites within probably an intermediate volcanic rock and then haloed by, by sericite. Aaron's then grouped the main stage gold event into two two parts. Uh, both are characterized by a green sericite. Uh, the, the early stage is pyrite stable and comes with a few base metal sulfides. And then the late main stage uh, also has some radial chlorite and is pyrite stable with some base metal sulfides. And then next we have a post-gold event. This is con mostly fracture controlled. Uh, chlorite smectite marcasite. And then we have our uh, very interesting ammonium bearing mineral assemblages. Um, and this consists of some sericite and budding tonight, which is really just a, an ammonium bearing feldspar where the potassium has been uh, substituted by ammonium. Uh, we feel this is probably a pre gold event, and that's largely based on some hyperspectral work that we've done on some drill core. You can see in this image uh, the purple color represents the ammonium bearing minerals, and uh, they're pretty clearly cross cut by illite and muscovite. Uh, and this sample was taken from Blackwater Hole 179 in, in a fairly mineralized intercept. Um, we also don't seem to find much correlation to gold grade uh, with the ammonium bearing minerals. So here's a deposit plan view. Uh, you can see the, the sediments are shown in the gray and then the maroon colors are tracheandesite. And then the uh, orange represents the more intermediate to felsic host rock sequence. Uh, in the deposit area, we find more clastic rocks off to the west. And we have more flow laminated rocks off to the east. And those two parts are bisected by what we feel is a post-mineral north-south trending fault. Uh, there are also a set of orthogonal faults. There are some trending uh, northwest and others east, uh, northeast. In section view, you get a better sense of the funnel shape to the host rocks at Blackwater. Um, I should also point out the, the, the white halos on this image represent where we have the ammonium bearing minerals. Uh, the red line denotes where we have our 0.3 gram per ton gold equivalent grade shell. And it's interesting to see here that the, the ore body actually dips very moderately to the north. Uh, the blue line there denotes where we have dominant sericite alterations. Not a big surprise since those are felsic rocks, more amenable to sericitization. Um, and I think one, one last thing I should note about this uh, slide is, is we feel that the felsic uh, host rocks are more passive hosts, meaning we have a permeability contrast between the, the surrounding andesites, which are much more tight, versus the brecciated and fractured up felsic rocks. 
This next slide is a summary of some of the age dating work that's gone on in the immediate Blackwater region, and they've been broken out by different methodologies. So at the very top, we see uranium lead age dates, and then just below that are a compilation of potassium argon, and then some rhenium osmium age dates that we collected with the help of Holly Stein down at her lab in uh, Colorado State University, the Airy Lab. And then a lot of the MDRU argon-argon results, which are dominantly from the, the Blackwater deposit area. And I think the key takeaway here is that we have a really nice story coming together. We see that um, we've pinned down the, the emplacement of the host rocks of both Capoose and Blackwater, uh, about 72 to 76 MA in the uranium lead dates up there at the top. And then we have uh, an overlapping and slightly younger series of intrusive events, uh, plutonic suite uh, there in the uranium lead column. And then as we move south to some of the, the age dates on mineralization, uh, we actually see an overlap between that, uh, the Molly at the Blackwater South Prospect and uh, with our, our oldest uh, age date on the strongest gold mineralization at Blackwater there. So um, there's, uh, there's some potential implications there. Uh, here's a slide summarizing Erin's sulfur isotope work, and she's uh, done a nice job here of breaking them out according to different mineral assemblages. Uh, the pre-gold assemblage is there in the dark gray. The light gray represents the main stage gold mineralization, and then there's a, a reference line, uh, the green line at the bottom there, which shows our mantle del 34 values, and so I think it's pretty obvious here uh, the, the key point is it looks like the sulfur is derived from a, an igneous source at Blackwater for the main stage mineralization. So this leads us to, to wonder, can we now confidently classify this deposit into, the, uh, into a certain group? Uh, as we just saw, the, the sulfur isotopes suggest a magmatic contribution to the fluids. Uh, and further, we now have a fluid path diagram on the sulfidation state plot uh, that Aaron's put together, and what we find is uh, a progression over time from a low to an intermediate sulfidation state, and then back into a low state. Uh, and if we compare this flow path to other established low sulfidation and high sulfidation systems, what we find is black water sits a little bit to the right, so um, it's, it's a little bit warmer. Uh, and, and in terms, or at least for the, the early stage assemblages, those are almost porphyry hot to begin with. Uh, other interesting points, uh, if we're trying to come up with a deposit type for black water, is that we, we have a real lack of uh, significant amounts of added or secondary silica, which is a very common gang mineral in epithermal systems. Uh, we don't have any evidence of boiling textures. So thinking back to the sulfur isotopes, uh, it would be really nice if we could explain what that magmatic contribution to the fluid, uh, where, where it originated from. So we've had a look at the, the Blackwater Intrusive Suite, which as I mentioned before is the one that sits closest to the deposit. And despite it looking like tombstone granite there in the photo, uh, it does come back with some pretty favorable chemistry for porphyry, uh, porphyry mineralization. It's, it's a paraluminous I-type uh, and it's very strongly oxidized. So it's sort of tantalizing. And um, if we have a look at where it sits on the map relative to Blackwater, you see it's about four kilometers to the south-southeast. Uh, we've also shown the key stock, which was mentioned in a couple of the talks before, um, down at the bottom. And I'd like to draw your attention to the two black dots that sit on the middle of the uh, cross-section line. That's where we drilled a couple of holes at the end of 2014, and what we found uh, was some pretty strong copper and moly mineralization. Um, this is a granite diorite rock, and we've also collected some rhenium osmium age dates on this, and this is the age date that overlaps by about 0.1 MA at uh, two standard deviation error between the, uh, the green sericite of Blackwater and, and this particular age date. So, should we be invoking some sort of link here? Um, this is a view of the cross section. The panel up at the top uh, shows some of those mineralization age dates. So the key sits off to the left or to the south on this plot. We're looking to the west. As we move to the north, we've got the Blackwater Pluton 
And you can see the Blackwater South drill holes there, uh, sort of in the center. Uh, and then further to the north is the Blackwater deposit. So if we, if we try to draw a link between this Blackwater South mineralization to uh, the Blackwater deposit proper, I think it would be kind of tough. You know, we're laterally migrating fluids quite a bit, or, or per perhaps we need to structurally reconstruct this thing so in such a way that we, we put the two closer together. Um, so we're, you know, we're clearly not ready to hang our hat on this interpretation yet, but uh, it, it does strongly suggest we have some sort of uh, uh, link. Perhaps there's other uh, intrusive activity sitting below or just laterally to the deposit itself. So what can we conclude so far? Uh, Blackwater does sit in the low to intermediate sulfidation state, and we do have a, a magmatic contribution to the fluid. Aaron's done a great job of showing us that the early pre-gold uh, mineral, uh, mineral assemblages sit above 300 degrees C and that they have probably a sedimentary source of the sulfur uh, and that they sit in the low sulfidation end of things. The main stage um, mineral assemblages sit in that 250 to 350 degree range. Uh, they have an igneous source of sulfur and uh, move from the intermediate to the low sulfidation regime. I think when we, we take all of this uh, evidence and put it together, we can pretty clearly say we've got, we've got a relationship between igneous activity in the region and precious and base metal mineralization at the deposit. Um, and Aaron, in a paper under review, uh, is, uh, says this is, this is now a low to intermediate sulfidation epithermal deposit. However, uh, I think we, we still need to remember epithermal deposits are mostly considered to be less than 300 degrees, sitting at less than 1,500 meters depth. Um, there are a couple, couple things. Um, we don't see that significant amount of added silica. Uh, we have a lot of whole rock geochem on the host rocks, and, and they're really coming back with sort of run-of-the-mill day site to rhyolite sort of SiO2 values. Um, and as we alluded to earlier, the, those uh, mineral assemblages are pretty hot, and at least uh, in the early stages of alteration. So some other questions that we have that Aaron's brought up. Uh, what drove the gold precipitation at Blackwater? We don't see any evidence of boiling, um, and it's probably not sulfidation, even though we do have that going on with the garnet and sulfide replacement of mafic sites in the very early non-mineral stage. Um, could it be fluid mixing? Uh, this is uh, a potential solution that Erin discusses in her paper and review. And um, some other ideas that we just talked about, uh, a colleague of mine that I know pretty well put together this thought-provoking diagram uh, suggesting, hey, maybe we have something going on just, just beneath black water. Uh, and then finally, for us explorers out in the room, great. Uh, what does this mean for me? How, how is this going to help me find the next deposit out there? Uh, what we really need to do is now start thinking about what are the implications for regional exploration going forward. Uh, I should thank so many different people. This has been a huge project, as many of you know, that a lot of people have been involved in. Uh, I'd especially like to thank our First Nations partners uh, up in the area. Without their support, uh, we wouldn't have a social license to operate, so thank you very much. Um, and I'll, I'll leave it there. Thanks for your time.